As Lord, a king literally and legally owns everything in his domain. The forests and the meadows, the mountains and the valleys, the rivers and the streams, the crops and the livestock, even the people and the houses they live in. Everything in the king's domain belongs to him. Because of this, a king has absolute and unquestionable control over his domain. This goes back to a king's sovereign authority. A king is sovereign by right of birth, but he is also sovereign by right of ownership. The fact of a king's sole ownership of his domain carries a couple of significant implications that are easily lost by people who have grown up in a democracy. First and rather obvious is that if the king owns everything, then no one in the kingdom owns anything. In a true kingdom, there is no such thing as private property ownership. Kingdom citizens are stewards, not owners. They may occupy the land, farm it, mine it, minerals, ores, and precious gems, build houses and places of business on it, and carry on all the other normal activities of human communities. But they do all of these only by the king's permission and good pleasure. Ultimately, everything belongs to him. Second, if the king owns everything, he can give anything to anyone at any time according to his own sovereign choice. In a democracy, if the prime minister or the president gives you property as a personal favor, it is called corruption. But if a king gives you property, it is called royal favor. And no one can question it or protest it because as owner, it is his prerogative to do as he pleases. Not only does a king possess the authority to distribute his property anytime, anywhere, to anyone as much as he wishes, but he also can switch his property from one person to another. He can take something from one person and give it to you, or he can take something from you and give it to somebody else. Because a king's dominion is so closely tied to territory, his wealth is measured by the size and richness of his domain. That is why kings always want to expand their kingdom. They seek to increase their wealth. Think about the British, French, and Spanish kingdoms of the last several hundred years. The kings of those realms dispatch ships and established colonies all over the world. Why? Because they wanted to enlarge the borders and fill the coffers of their kingdom. The larger and richer their domain, the greater their reputation and glory. King and Lords Although I have been speaking about lordship from the content of earthly kingdoms, Everything I have said so far applies with even greater validity to the kingdom of heaven and its king. We have already seen that God is the king of heaven and earth by divine right of creation. He is king of all because he created all. And because every king is automatically a lord, the king of all is also the lord of all. He owns everything because he made everything. The Bible, the constitution of the kingdom of heaven, plainly identifies God as king and lord of all. One of the most common Hebrew words used to refer to God in the Old Testament as Adani, which literally means proprietor or owner. It is usually translated Lord. The personal name for God, Yahweh, although difficult to translate with complete accuracy, carries the same idea of master, owner, or Lord. This biblical picture of God as Lord is further enhanced by the fact that in most Bible versions, the personal name Yahweh, wherever it occurs, is replaced with the word Lord. This is in keeping with an ancient Jewish tradition where devout Jews so respected and honored God's name that they would not even speak it or read it aloud to ensure that they did not inadvertently violate the third commandment by misusing his name. Instead, they substituted the word Adani or Lord. So over 
and over the truth is hammered home. God is the Lord. God is the Lord. God is the Lord. This truth is reiterated even in the most basic confession of faith for a Jew recited every morning. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Deuteronomy 6 and 4 through 5. So in this way, the Jews were reminded every day that their God was owner of all. This included heaven and earth. An ancient Hebrew poet expressed it this way. May you be blessed by the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to man. Psalm 115 and 15 through 16. Emphasis added. As a maker and owner of heaven and earth, God could give any portion of it to anyone he chose. And he chose to give the earth to man, not for man to be owner, but ruler, manager, or steward. Here are some additional references verifying God's rights to lordship over the property of earth. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Psalm 24 and 1 through 2. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing to him psalm of praise. God reigns over the nations. God is seated on his holy throne. The nobles of the nations assemble as the people of the God of Abraham. For the kings of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. Psalm 47 and 7 through 9. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. Exodus 7, 5. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Psalm 8 and 1a. I said, the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. Psalm 16 and 2. The poor will eat and be satisfied. They who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nation will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. Psalm 22 and 26 through 28. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. Psalm 23 and 1. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. Psalms 24 and 7 through 10. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. Haggai 2 and 8. In the same way as the Old Testament reveals God as King and Lord and owner of all, the New Testament reveals Jesus Christ as Lord and owner of all. First of all, as we have already seen, Jesus came announcing the arrival and reestablishment of the kingdom of heaven on earth, something only the king himself could do. And because a king is automatically a lord, this means that Jesus is Lord also. In addition, the most common Greek word for Lord, kurios, is applied to Jesus repeatedly in the New Testament. Kurios signifies having power. It also means one who possesses ultimate authority, master. Everything the Old Testament says about God as Lord, the New Testament says about Jesus. The Lordship of Jesus is also by creative rights and was a natural result of his role in the creation of all things, both seen and unseen. In essence, we do not make Jesus Lord. He is Lord by creative right. 
whether we acknowledge him or not. 